uh, come to the uh, service now or to the message this morning, um, and then we'll have a baptism immediately following. All right, uh, by way of introduction, well, let's pray. Let, let me pray with you real quick, and then we'll look at the, the, pre, uh, the, the message. Now, Lord God, come to you now, and thank you for the opportunity to gather here with the brothers and sisters in the Lord, and thank you, Lord, for this family that you've given me, and they, they are my treasure, Lord, and I was a lost man, and I remember my friends, and these are so different, Lord, and I thank you for putting me in this family, and I pray, God, that your spirit be in our midst, and that you would teach us from your word by means of thy Holy Spirit, that your spirit would come and speak to people's hearts and do what I cannot do. And I pray that you'd help my mouth and my mind to think and say things that would be appropriate and right and helpful to this bunch of people that have gathered uh, to hear something from you, Lord. And a very humbling thing to have them come and, and look to me to give a, a message from you, Lord. And I pray you not disappoint them and uh, feed them with something that'll uh, cause their spirituality to be healthy and help them, help them to grow and be strong soldiers of Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for it. And we pray these things and ask them in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 I believe we're in some very serious times these days as far as the church goes and as far as our nation goes. The nation has drastically changed through this COVID thing. Uh, uh, they have used it uh, as a platform to make some horrendous changes, most of them uh, for the worst. Uh, I, I believe that it is a time where the churches and the people that want to serve the Lord are going to be hindered. Uh, more and more as time goes on, we'll be hindered. Uh, things that we used to take for granted, uh, things that used to be real easy and to do and uh, as Christians are going to get difficult. As, as time goes on, I perceive that uh, the powers that be will continue to undermine and restrict the freedoms that we have as far as our worship and our way to live for Jesus Christ. Uh, our, our society takes little tiny bits out. When they want to accomplish a big thing, they're very patient. And they'll take all the time. They'll take 20 years. They don't care. And they just take little bites out of it. If, if they try to move too quick, everybody will say, no, we're not. We don't think homosexual is good. No. They just take a little bit of bite. Yeah. Oh, it's not so bad. Look at this guy does it. This lady does it. Why do we want to think bad about that? And they just take little bites, little bites, and then pretty soon, bigger bite, bigger bite. Pretty soon, you got all the people thinking it's perfectly okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still just as wicked as it's ever been. And God's word has never changed, and it's never made an excuse. It's always just held true. Uh, but our society just keeps going. And if they don't like you to have guns, and they want the gun laws to be gone, they're going to publicize every single negative thing on the news about guns and how bad they are to the place where you're going to think they're bad to have one. And it just takes a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Pretty soon, everybody will be turning in their guns. Uh, same thing with patriotism. We used to be a people that would stand and say pledge allegiance to the flag. And a national anthem, when a football game would start, they'd stand and reverence the national anthem and sing it. And sing it with their hand on their heart. And can't even do that anymore. And everything is uh, being changed. Everything that was male and female is now neuter. Everything that was, uh, you know, the, the wicked has turned to be, uh, you know, good. And the good has turned to be evil. Uh, the, the preachers are looked down upon, and the churches are being looked down upon, and the Christians are uh, looked down upon these days. And I, I'm afraid, well, I'm not afraid, but uh, I, I preached this message this morning because I believe it's going to continue to worsen. And, and it's going to still, it's going to be a, a time where uh, uh, little by little, they're going to continue to take our freedoms away. You go door to door now and pass out uh, tracts, but... Uh, one day that'll come to a halt. Uh, one day you'll come to the church and there'll be a note on the door say, this church is closed, and it'll say from the health department or something like that, or uh, what's that one they, they did uh, over there with the, is it ATF? 
uh, come in there and say, this uh, church is no longer open and, until further notice. Uh, we're going to review. We're going to look. We're going to see what's wrong with this church. And uh, I, I'm thinking that uh, the days are coming where that might happen. You'll come here thinking that you just get to come to church like you always did, and it'll be closed. Or, or maybe the pastor will be in jail because of hate speech or something. Uh, we used to have freedom of speech. We used to be able to voice our opinion and say what was on our heart. It was part of what our founding forefathers declared for us. And now they've taken that freedom away, and now you could go to jail and even in prison. If I go out on the street, preach now, uh, street and preach now and tell people about hell and tell people that they could go there because of their sin, I could be viewed, uh, that could be viewed as hate speech. And uh, I, I'm now an offender. I used to be a, 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 a preacher of righteousness to help the people see their way to Christ, and now uh, I've become a criminal. So things are a little sketchy these days. And because of the seriousness of the times that we're living, I want to preach this message to you uh, this morning in hopes of putting a fighting spirit in you and, uh, and the right and the value that we should have for our faith and how we like to live our lives as Christians and practice our faith. And so we'll look now at Joshua chapter 22 and read verse number 1. And I'll preface the message this morning uh, by... Joshua coming over uh, from the uh, from the Amor Amorite area across Jordan and coming into the promised land which God had uh, decreed for them and the first thing they hit was Jericho which is about here and as they came in God said Joshua I need you to take all your people and I need you to go through this whole land here I need you to go for all the way from here, all the way down from, from uh, Dan all the way to Judah. I want you to take all your troops one city at a time. And they're, they're heathen. They burn their children to Moloch. They're false gods. They worship idols. Brother Bay, good to see you. Amen. 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 Uh, they, they do all this stuff. And he says, I, I've had it up to here. I don't like them no more. I want you to take your troops and I want you to just go through there and take them out. Just take them all out. Start with Jericho. Go to Ai. Go in and just mow through there and just take everything down. And I want you guys, my people, I want you guys to inhabit their land. I want you to take it. And uh, so they, they, they come up in through here. They come up in through here. Before they went over Jordan, they come up in through here. And when they got up here, uh, Bashan's right in here. And when they got into Bashan, boy, Jacob, they saw the farmland was beautiful. Grass this tall, thick and green, boy. And they brought their goats and cattle in there. And they said, man, we'd like to have a little farmhouse right here. And uh, Joshua said, nothing doing, nothing doing. God, I think it was Moses at the time, he said, nothing doing. We're supposed to go over Jordan. We're supposed to cross to the other side. God said, our promised land is here. We're not over here in Bashan. No, sir. We're over here. And, uh, and so Moses said, that's what we're going to do. So, uh, so the, the guys from Manasseh came to Moses and said, Moses, we really like this land here where all this farmland is. Can't we just have some property here? When we have our inheritance, can you give us this? Moses said, no, no. He says, we need to go over Jordan. And he says, well, we're going to. He, he says, I want you to go over Jordan because if I let you stay here, we need the fighting power. We need you guys to help us in this, to, to overtake all these other people. And if you settle in over here, we're going to be. And then, and then the, tribe of, uh, the tribe of Reuben said the same thing. They like this area. And the tribe of Gad, they said the same thing. So the half tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh, huge tribe. And then this one, and then this one, uh, this one was uh, Reuben, and this one was Gad, and this one was the half tribe of Manasseh. And all three of those two and a half tribes said, we want to stay over here. And Moses said, look, I need soldiers. And if you stay over here, I ain't going to have soldiers. And I need soldiers. So you got to promise to finish the fighting first. And if you'll promise me to finish the fighting first, when we get time to divvy up the land, I'll give you some land over there. And they said, deal. Boy, they shook on it. 
And uh, they went and crossed Jordan. And, and when they crossed Jordan, God told Moses, you don't get to go. And Moses said, man, Lord, I really want to. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you see it. But you don't get to go. So he took them up on this high mountain about right here. And uh, took them up here and let him look at the promised land over here. And, and Moses got to see it, but he never got, to, never got to go in. But Joshua took him in. And so they went in there, Brother Cho, and they, and they beat everybody up. <laughs> Uppercuts, <laughs> cross, left hooks, everything. They beat them all up. And they, and, they, and they killed all of them. And every time they went into a, uh, Miss Leah, every time they went into one of them cities, all the wealth them cities had, they put it in their pocket. And they had bags, I'm big, big bags of money. Yeah, true. And uh, every time they conquered a city, they come away with, with lots of spoil. Bible calls it spoil. And so the treasurer, whoever that was, was doing pretty good. He had his calculator out every day, boy. He was ringing up the stuff, you know, and boy, he had it going on. And, uh, and they were taking all these cities. And finally, they got about, well, I'd say 85% of them all conquered. And Joshua said, we're going to have a big meeting today, and we're going to divvy up the land. And all Israelites were excited about it, and they said, okay, let's divvy up the land. And Joshua says, all right, I promised you some land over in Manasseh. You guys go ahead and take that. And uh, you Reubenites, you want to go on the other side of Jordan? It's all ours now. You go ahead and go over there now. And he says, uh, you Gadites, you over there, you go ahead and go over there. Buy your, you can have your farm. I give you all this land. And he said, take all this money with you. And they, boy, they loaded up a bunch of money, and they all went across the, the river, and they started putting out their, their homes, start building their, their cabins. And then you know what they did, Amrit? They thought, well, you know what? We're going to have children being raised in our new land. And as we raise these children, they're going to wonder, this big old river that goes between our two our two." areas here uh, this big river is an automatic border it's just automatic border between us and as our children go up they're not going to think that we associate with them across the river and we're worried about that we want our children to know that we believe just like they do and when it came time to serve God we go and serve God all the feast days we go we do everything they do we're just like they are we're just on the other side of Jordan but we want our children to know. So they said, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's make us an altar. And it's not going to be for sacrifice. And it's not going to be blood atonements to make atonements for his sin. It's not going to be anything to do with worship. It's just going to be when our children get older and they say, what mean is this altar that we'll be able to tell them this is because we're associated with them. And we worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And our, our temple is in Shiloh, and we go there for worship. And all the feast days we observe. So every time we come across this river, we go there because we are of them. We are not separate. We want our children to know. And uh, so they built this altar. And when they did, all oh, them Israelites on the other side said, uh-oh, we got us a huge problem. These guys are trying to have their own worship service, and they're going to separate from us, and we serve the one and only true God, and now they got them an altar going over there, and they're going to get something else going like they did in Peor, or like they did with Jeroboam, and God's wrath is going to smite all of us, and we're all worried about it, and these idiots are having another church, getting another temple going, and they're just worried about it, and they're so upset about it, that they all got the, the heads of the father. I think a hundred of them. I think they got a hundred of them. Big boy. Big shots. Yeah. The heads of the fathers, it said. Ten from every tribe. And boy, they come over there and they walked up to those guys by that altar and they said, what meaneth this altar? And he said, you guys intend to bring God's wrath down upon us like we did in the days of Peor and like it did at the days of Jeroboam. Uh, well, those days hadn't happened yet, but, but, but they got this, you got the idea. And they was worried about it. Amen. They was worried about it. And so we're going to read about what happened and, uh, and get a message out of it if we can. So let's look at verse number one. Then Joshua called the Reubenites. That's these guys over here. Look up here, right here. These are Reubenites. And the Bible says they called the Reubenites and the Gadites. These are the Gadites right here. These guys. And then these are the Manasseh guys, the half-tribe. 
the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said unto them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you, saying, you know, go over and help us destroy all these cities. And you guys did a good job. You were faithful. And you showed yourself the man, and you did what you said you were going to do. You kept your promise. And uh, so they had proven themselves to be loyal men. They had proven themselves to be men of faith. And they've proven themselves to be men of bravery because they went with them and they took those cities out. And they didn't go to their lands until it was done. Verse 3, ye have not left your burden these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. Verse 4, and now the Lord your God hath given us rest unto your brethren as he promised them. Therefore now return ye and get you unto your tents and unto the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. So here's a godly permission uh, to be separated from the body uh, by this river. Verse 5. But take diligent heed to, your, to the commandment and the law. You will be geographically separated. That's going to be an automatic temptation not to join us. Convenience is going to make you want to stay over there and not join. It's going to be extra hard for you to come across that river. I'll go all the way to Shiloh. And so he says, uh, uh, be diligent he to take uh, to the commandment of the Lord, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. Verse 6. So a stern admonishment by Moses, or was it Joshua? Joshua. A stern, uh, uh, you guys watch out now. Watch out. Make sure you keep, just like you said you promised to fight for us, I want you to promise to keep your faith. And don't let this distance and don't let this river and don't let complications stop you from being with us. We are together in this. Amen. We're the people of God. And this separation could weaken us and weaken the cause that we have here in this land. And so he gives them this admonishment. Verse 6, so Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went into their tents. And now to the one half tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession to Bashan. But unto the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side Jordan westward. And when Joshua sent them away also unto their tents, then he blessed them. So he prayed for them. Isn't that good? I like that. Prayed for them and said, God bless you. Every, everything you put your hand to do, might he prosper you and help you and guide you and keep you. And just, he just was wanted their good. Amen? Like a, like, a, like a good general should do. He wanted good for the people, even though they were going to go on the other side. We're going we're gonna to do everything we can to keep this almost, almost, uh, almost, almost assuredly going to separate. But we're going to do everything we can to keep it a unit. Keep it a unit. Amen. Uh, verse uh, 7, uh, verse, verse 8, thank you. And he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents. Boy, they were loaded too. And with very much cattle. Yeah, they had lots of it. With silver, with gold, with brass, with iron, and very much uh, raiment, raiment Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. So they, every time they took those cities, the money just built up. So they had lots to give out. Wouldn't that, that sound good, don't it? Amen. Almost sound like a judgment seat of Christ is over. Everybody's got a sack. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they've been made very rich with the spoils of the enemy. And uh, we have also, brethren, been made very rich in the promises that God has given to us. And it ain't money. We get something much, much better. Amen. Much prettier, much more enjoyable, a lot more peace and a lot more wealth and godliness. Amen. Much better than uh, stuff that money could never buy. That us as children of God have. And I, I'm glad. I'm glad to be a Christian today. And I'm glad to be in my church. I'm glad to have brothers and sisters to uh, fight for the cause of Jesus Christ in San Pedro. Amen. And, uh, and, I, and it's nice when, when we all pull together. Really nice. And it's not so nice when we're fragmented. And that's what he was worried about. Yeah. He was worried about being fragmented. He was worried about, oh, man, if they, if they get settled in over there, 
There's going to be a lot of temptation to stay. And, uh, boy, I hope they don't. And so he is real concerned. Uh, verse 9. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Nasser returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the ha- land of Canaan, to go unto the country of Gilead, uh, to land of their possession, whereof they were possessed according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Verse 10. And when they were come unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Nasha built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. So it was not a small effort, Brother Eric. They, they pulled out all their resources, Brother. They, they made a big monster amen, altar. They, they wanted to make sure that everybody that crossed the river over here is going to see this thing. Amen. Yeah, they, they, it was a big one. And, uh And uh, uh, so, but they had this altar going on, and of course, this alarmed everybody. But verse 11, and the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. So there was a passageway, maybe it's a big bridge or something there, don't know, but probably right up in here somewhere, I guess. I would get, I would say, right up around in there. Shiloh. Uh, this is Jerusalem. Shiloh is about right here. This is where their temple was. I probably should have put that up there for you. This is where this is where all the good worship was going on. This is boy, if you had sin and you wanted to make atonement for sin, you go to Shiloh. But you can see how far that is from where they were. And so uh, he was uh, real concerned about it. And they they built this altar. And uh, wherever they crossed, I'm gonna guess the altar probably somewhere. Well, it's right on this side of Jordan. Uh, maybe it was over here. I forget. Doc, you remember which side of Jordan? Yeah, I think it says here. I think it was on this side. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. It must be on the bit, but I think I saw it in here. We'll, we'll keep reading and see. Maybe it says. But you get the idea of this altar going up and all the children of Israel. So wait, 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 wait a minute. We have our way of worship. Now you're going to come up with something else. God ain't going to be happy with that. And boy, we may, be in, we may all be in trouble if you act stupid. And we don't want you acting stupid. And so they're so concerned about it, they're ready to kill him over it. Oh, yeah, they're serious about it. They said, man, if God ain't with us, we're done. But we're just a little bunch of people. If God don't help us, we are out. <laughs> and they're telling them the right thing. They're telling the right thing. All right, where have I got you? In verse uh, 11, and the children of Israel heard say, behold, the children of Israel, uh, Reuben, okay, verse 12. And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. Boy, I'm telling you, they're serious about it. They're serious about it. Verse 13, and the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh into the land of Gilead. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest. Man, they're taking the man of God with them. <laughs> they are dead serious about this. Now, he's going to come over and preach at them. If they don't want to trust the elders, they'll, they'll get the preacher there. Amen. And uh, then verse number 13. Of, uh, four, uh, so this problem was going to separate them spiritually. That priest was there, see. So they was worried about, about their worship service and how it was going to be conducted. Whether it's going to be like us or they're going to do something else going. They got that, that priest showing up. Verse 14. And with the ten princes of each chief house a prince... So 10 per tribe, 11 tribes. Huh? I think it's 10 total because there's 10 tribes that were there. And with him, 10 princes of each chief house, a prince. Okay, I got you. Throughout all the tribes of Israel. Yeah, that sounds right. And each one was a head over the house of their fathers among the thousands of Israel. And so they got 10 big shots coming over there along with that priest. And uh, so there was a huge problem. Verse 15, and they came unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the half-tribe of Manasseh unto the land of Gilead and spake with them, saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of Israel, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the Lord God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord in that ye have built you an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord? And so if this is rebellion uh, or if this is sin, then it is going to separate them, and they don't like that. Verse 17, uh, is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, for which we were not cleansed until this day? 
although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, we're still suffering from that last one. So we don't want another one to start. We ain't over the first one. Verse 18, but that ye must turn away this day from following the Lord. And it will be seeing you rebel today against the Lord that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. So they had personal interest in what these guys were doing. And so now we see why they were so serious about it. Because they knew that the wrath of God could fall on the whole bunch over their uh, deciding to be rebels against the ways that they were taught by Moses. So their, de their decision affects every, all Israel. Verse 19, notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth, and take possession among us. But rebel not against the Lord, nor rebel against us in building you an altar beside the altar of the Lord our God. So they said, if, if the land is sinful and you guys can't handle it, and you're trying to build an altar to make sure the sin thing is uh, taken care of, don't do it. Just tear the stupid altar down. You come back over here, forget this land. Come back over here and dwell with us. But don't separate. Whatever you do, don't say, well, let nothing stop you from being part of us. And this altar thing is serious. We don't want it. And, they, boy, they wanted 100% they wanted unity uh, with these three tribes. All right, where have I got you? Verse 20. Thank you. I'm glad somebody's paying attention. Amen. <laughs> All right, verse, uh, uh, let's see, he's saying, okay, verse 20. Uh, Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing? And wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel. And that man perished, not alone in his iniquity. Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, Lord God of gods, the Lord of God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel he shall know, if it be in rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord, uh, save us not this day. He said, man, if we're doing that, kill us all. We, we deserve it. In other words, we're saying, I agree with everything you're saying. I'm with you guys. You right. You right. He he's got a he's got a good audience right here. They're going. We agree with everything you said. I wish our congregation was like that here. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. Oh man, that just gave me a revelation there. <laughs> Amen. Verse 23, that we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord. Or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering or to offer peace offering thereon, let the Lord himself require it. And he said, we're, we're, not, we're not building this altar for, for religious purposes at all. And so now all them guys were standing there and they, they got their swords, you know, and they said that. And they went, oh, well, kind of put the sword down a little bit. And a couple of them are starting to put it away. Go, oh, really? So, so you're not going to have a different religion going. They said, no, no, no. Oh, oh, then what are you doing? Pull it back out. Then, then, then what are you doing? Yeah, you just it was like us. It's like we would be, right? I mean, we're human. This is what we do. Uh, we, 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 are, we are a unit. We want to stay a unit. We don't want to work together. We don't want to be separated. We don't want something to get in between and, and make us weak. We want to be strong for the Lord. Our cause is a great cause. It's the best cause in all the world. And we want it to be as unit and as best as we can. And so when people start getting sideways and start thinking something else and start having reasons why they don't want to come, it's a problem. Yeah. It's problematic, especially in the days we're living now. Yeah. So you can see why I'm preaching it, because it relates to us. Yeah. It, it's something that goes on right now everywhere. Uh, the powers that be are trying to dwindle and pull and, and take pieces out of it, and some of you are going to be affected by it. And some of you are going to think there's something to that. And, and if you don't have the purpose of God on the top of your priorities, then, then you tend to be, uh, go with it, see. Yeah. And it'll, it'll weaken us and tear us down. Right. And, uh, God, and, and, and boy, uh, God wrote this story in here to help everybody that would read these stories to see how to stay a unit. All right, so verse uh, uh, 25. 24. 24. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? And so he says, we're worried about our children. We're worried about how when they're raised up and they see that there's a division here. 
And they see that we're not on the land with them over in Shiloh and all them people worship. And we're not over here. And they start thinking that, oh, uh, you know, we have our own little thing to do until they hit that altar. And we're, oh, that altar is there to remind us that, no, we're with them. That altar wasn't a sacrifice altar. It wasn't a religious thing. It was a reminder. It was a witness to everybody that would cross Jordan there that these people over here worship God, and they serve the God uh, of the Israel, and, they, and they, their temple's in Shiloh, and, and they have blood atonement for their sins, and, and they, they worship God on the feast days and all the things that Moses commanded them. Now, verse 25, for the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, and ye children of Reuben and children of Gad, and ye have no part in the Lord, so your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not to burn offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us, that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt uh, with uh, with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in time to come, ye have no part in the Lord. So boy, these guys had a good, a real good idea there. They're going to have them a, a really nice, well-built witness that let everybody know on this side, every Israelite on this side of Jordan had the same God as all the people on this side of Jordan. Amen. And boy, when it come time uh, to, for the feast day, it'd be real convenient to stay over here and worship. You can wor Have you ever heard Christians say, oh, the wilderness is my church? Yeah. yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, they got their own little thing they like to do. And they, it ain't what God said to do, but it's what they like to do. And for convenience sake, it's real easy not to get with God's people. I know some Christians live far out. they got to make a trip to come in here. It's not easy to do. It takes some character to do that. Amen. And if you're over here, buddy, you, if it's time to worship at Shiloh, then you got to do some hiking. Amen. you got to do some hiking to get to Shiloh. And that's going to be an ordeal. But bless God, it's worthwhile. Amen. Amen. And, and so uh, they said, well, this altar is there to help our children understand that we're all the same over here. Where am I at now, Ron? 28. I got her right on the front row. I, I'm, I'm, I got a good setup here. All right, verse 28. Therefore said we that it shall be when they should say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may again behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made uh, not for burnt offerings or sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and to turn this day from following the Lord to build an altar for burnt offerings, for meat offerings, or for sacrifice besides the altar of the Lord our God that is before the, his tabernacle. And when Phinehas the priest and the princes of the congregation and the heads of the thousands of Israel uh, which were with him heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake, it pleased them. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, said unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because ye have not committed this trespass against the Lord. Now ye have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And so they, now, now they're convinced uh, that, that you, we're not doing this to be uh, disassociated from you or start our own little thing. We're, we're, in, we're with you all the way. Yeah. Verse 32, And Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest and the princes returned from the children of Reuben and from the children of Gad out of the land of Gilead unto the land of Canaan to the children of Israel and brought them word again. And the thing pleased the children of Israel. And the children of Israel blessed God and did not intend to go up against them in battle to destroy the land wherein the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed. Ed. Know anybody named Ed? <laughs> <laughs> and here's what it means. For it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. Amen. So uh, and they go through there, and old Ed was standing there. <laughs> and uh, Ed was there to testify that you all, you people on this side, you keep, you pass me right on by and you go right into Shiloh 
And you go in there where the real altar is, and the altar of God. Yeah. Amen. You go there. And they were separated by the land and by the river, uh, but not by intent or heart. Now, I want you to think about that. They might have had a long distance between them, but as far as the heart was concerned, it was jointed with them. They were not separated, not in heart, only in geographics. And their heart was right. They were with the people. We're going to have church over in Shiloh. We're not going to do our own thing. And though divided in geographics, they were, they were uh, separated that way, but not in faith and not in their intent to serve the Lord. And when it came time for the feast days, they were just going to pack a, a lunch and maybe a dinner. But we're going to get over there, and we're taking our families with us. We may have to buy a couple of oxen to pull the cart. We may have to uh, come with a whole bunch of neighbors. But bless God, when it came time for the feast days, we're going. And when it came time to make atonement for our sins, we're bringing our lamb, and we're going to Shiloh with that lamb. And I don't care if it takes a week to get there. We're going. And you can see how important it was for them. Can you see how important it was for them? No matter what the obstacles was, it was important for them to make sure that they got to the church. They got to the place where God's people were. That's where the strength of God was, with the people. And that's where the strength of, the, the hope of San Pedro is the strength of this church. Amen. And I know there's obstacles. And I know it's inconvenient sometimes to get here. And I know sometimes it's a long way. Some of you live a way out. And it's difficult. But bless God, it's worth it. Amen. It's worth it. We need the numbers. We need the people. <clears throat> I need some water. If somebody can get me a glass of water, thank you, brother. Uh, but we need, we need the people. Amen. Uh, the plan, extra time if you have to, uh, to make the distance. Uh, every time they got to the river, they saw that altar, and it reminded them. Uh, the things that they had to guard against uh, was, was sin. Uh, sin and, and their own uh, life and how strong they were spiritually would, would make them change their mind when it came time to go across the river. Yeah. And I just want to say, if you find yourself out of church, sometimes it'll be your sins that's causing you to, to stray from being here. But that's when you need to be here the most. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, the, the, the thing that you don't want to do the most is the thing that you need the most. Brother, when I get sideways, it, it doesn't take me long. I come into church, sometimes I come into church like this. And boy, that, sir, that first song I'm going, I'm going. Second song I'm going. Third song I'm ready to go to the altar. I'm exaggerating all this stuff to make a point. There's a spirit that I need. And that spirit wars against my old flesh. My old fleshy man is just prone to leave the God I love. You know how it is. Yeah. It's just always, uh, find some fun, find some trinket, run and play. It's always, uh, uh, let the old, but see, he said, uh, if there's one thing to really guard against to keep you coming, is the sin. You've got to guard against the sin. He said he didn't want you to rebel this day. Talked about sins of the heart. And, uh, and those, those things there would be something that would keep them uh, from coming. And, uh, and then you've got to think about this, too. One thing that will keep you from coming to church, sometimes convenience. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Sometimes just convenience. i got a gas station right by my house, right there on 13th Street. That's stone throw away. I can walk to it. Nothing to it. And the gas price ain't that great. But it's there. It's convenient. Uh, they got another gas station on uh, Carson Boulevard over in Torrance. It's 20 cents cheaper over there. And my wife say, go over there. I said, honey, I'm in a hurry. I got to I gotta just get gas right here. I'm paying the extra. Why am I paying the extra? Convenience. And that's, to me, that's, I pay the extra. Just convenience is worth money to me. Amen. And it is to you too. Convenience is one of those things that plays a big part in our decision making. Brother Albert, you live out in Lakewood. That takes 20 minutes to half hour to get here. I remember Brother DeShams, he lived out, uh, where did DeShams? He lived out uh, almost to Corona, 40 miles from here. Drug his old family in the church. Did that for years. I'm just saying, sometimes convenience. Sometimes you're getting ready for church. I live in Carson. I'm about 11 miles away. And I'm getting ready for church. I said, man, I don't want to go. You ever hear that, you ever hear that song, uh, Custer? Hey, Mr. Custer, I don't want to go. 
I'll be getting my suit and tie on. I'm tired. I just got back from the jail. Oh, I don't want to go. That's just the flesh. Just the old flesh. But I go. I go because it's right. I go because I need to go. I go because you need me to go. Not because I'm pastor. If I was a ch- I'd still feel the same way. If I, was, if I was sitting where you're sitting, I'd feel the same way. You need my voice. You need my amens. You need my prayers. You need my presence. We encourage each other when we see each other. And we discourage each other when we don't. It matters. Convenience matters. Uh, sin will keep you away, and convenience will keep you away. And here, I like this part. Their children. They were worried about their children. They didn't want to have a relationship with God that didn't include their children. They were worried that maybe the children wouldn't believe like they believe. And they wanted to make sure that, that separation like it was, the children might not believe the same way and they had that altar there as a witness this is why we go this is why we take the trouble this is why we cross Jordan this is why we pack our bed this is why we decide to spend the week over there if we have to and the children need to see it and listen the hope of the church for tomorrow is your children the hope of America for tomorrow is your children amen the hope of Bayview is our children little boys and little girls who grow up to know the Lord and can praise the Lord. You know, little children can praise the I like what Nathan said. Uh, that, that's hope in that. Amen. Uh, but they wanted, they were concerned for their kid. And if anything else, you know, there's a lot of times I don't backslide just because of her. And him. And him. And him. Uh, sometimes I feel like doing something stupid. And I say, man, I do that. What would my kids think of me? Yeah. I ain't doing that. <laughs> that's dumb. I ain't giving up. I ain't giving my testimony for that dumb thing. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, you say, well, it's real difficult to come to church, and I got all these things I got to do. Yeah, I know, but what about your kids? I, I remember Bob, Bob Gray. It was Bob Gray, I think it was. He had, he had about four or five little kids. And, boy, they got done with it. Uh, Brother George, they had, a, they had a, a meeting that they went to. And they drove 100 and something miles to the meeting. And they got home late Saturday night and early Sunday morning. They had involvement at the church, and they had to be there an hour early. And, uh, and they said, okay, you kids, we're going to be up at 6 this morning. Once you kids ready to go to church, we're going to be rolling out of here at 8 o'clock. And them kids were all complaining, oh, we, do we have to go to church? Mama, yeah, we got to go to church. And, uh, boy, you better hurry because we ain't got much time. And Mama stood there at the front door, and all the kids lined up to get in the car, and she had a wash rag in her hand, and they stuck their face, and they washed that face. The next one come on, they washed that face, the next one, and get them cleaned up for church. And they got in the car and get ready to go to church, and one of the little boys said, Mama, it's important to go to church, isn't it? She says, you better believe it, son. Better believe it. They're going to go through all this trouble, get up early, get home late, and barely have time to clean up. Boy, church must be important. Yeah, son, it's important. And it's not something we take lightly. And if I find some little reason or some little excuse not to come, then you may think that I don't think it's important. And I'm raising you to think that you don't have to think it's important. And if I want you to live for God, or if I want there to be a good witness in San Pedro, you got to know it's important. Yeah. And if it ain't important to you, man, we've done. Because even the stalwart, even the mighty Christians, we're, we're coming to some times where yeah. even the heavyweights are going to be looking at this thing and second guessing it. Yeah. But we're living in some times now we need to be, we need to know we're saved. We need to be baptized people. We need to be members of a local New Testament church. We need to be Bible people. And San Pedro needs to hear our testimony, needs to see our testimony, needs to hear our message. And the more of us, the better. The more of us, the better. And, and what they was worried about is being fragmented. And that's what I worry about. That's what all of us worry about, especially as the days approach. It's getting fragmented. And uh, we're going to have to have some real character to stay stay together. They was worried about losing unity. And they were worried about losing a good personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The most important thing in your life is a personal walk 
with Jesus Christ. And that, that is hanging in the balance if, if the things we do as Christians is weak. All that hangs in the balance. So my message this morning is, uh, let's see, what did I title this thing? I have to get Rhonda to tell me. <laughs> no, I, I'm really bad at, at uh, titles, but I titled this one, We Are Resolved. Amen. We're resolved. No matter how far we got to go, no matter how, what, no matter how much trouble it takes, uh, no matter what the world does uh, for our children's sake, for our own personal walk with God, we're just going to make this happen. We're going to make it happen. And we're going to be faithful. You know what I like about those guys? When Joshua was getting ready and he told them to go over there before they built the altar, he said, you guys, he, boy, he patted them on the back. He says, you guys stayed with us. You were loyal men. You were faithful men. You were brave men. You fought with us shoulder to shoulder. And you, uh, we, can't, we didn't want to lose you guys. Amen? But he let them go because Moses said it would be okay. And when they saw that well-watered land over there, they just wanted it. And there was no problem with that. But if you, if you, if you live that far, you just got to go the extra mile. Amen. Let's all stand this morning.